Hey, what's up everybody? A uh, quick video today of me setting up my Hammer A341 jointer planar combo. Um, I was super excited to get this. It was like a dream machine of mine to be able to um, start working with hardwood and, you know, building some finer furniture. Uh, these machines always arrive a bit dirty, so I'm just giving the, the bed a bit of a clean. And I'm doing some kind of basic setup stuff here just to kind of get the machine ready to be used. Oh, whoopsie. Um, as you can see, it's still on the pallet, and so it's quite easy to move around. Um, this is just some thoughts. I'm going to cover like one or two key areas, and I'm not going to talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. If you want a really comprehensive review of using one of these machines, then check out Bent's Woodworking. He's done an amazing review telling you like step by step how to set it up. So I'm not going to recover a lot of stuff that's in that video. This is just, you know, some of my own observations as I go through it. Uh, this is my first look at the spiral cutter block, which I think is a must if you're going to get one of these machines. It makes it so much quieter and you get a better finish and easier to change the blades, etc, etc. I was kind of surprised that it seemed to always roll back to one position. I don't know why that was. Maybe the, the motor was pulling it back or maybe it was just out of balance. I'd be surprised if it's out of balance, but maybe it is. This is me taking apart the, or sorry, taking off the um, fence, the fence that supports the fence. Well, maybe it's a rail. Okay, this is me taking off the rail that supports the fence and attaching it to the end of the table. Um, there's a whole, there's a combination of like which washers you need where to do that. And uh, Bent's video has, has got loads of info on that. You're meant to mount the rail 19 mil below the top of the table. I think it's 19 mil. Um, and again, I got this idea from Bent, so I'm going to mention him like a thousand times during this video, um, where you get some dominoes on a piece of plywood. And so I did that to get the height of the the rail much more easily. I think it's like a 10 mil, 5 mil and a 4 mil domino. I just nailed them onto a piece of wood. Clamp it all together and tighten the bolts. Now note that the uh, slider that's inside the rail is flush with the end of the rail that you can see just there. So now I've put the bracket on for the fence and I'm just going about attaching the fence. You can see the fence coming on here. and. I think it's okay in, in, in use because, you know, I've got a little bit more experience with it now, but it is a little bit unwieldy almost that you've got this massive long fence that is held square or held on partly by this rail at the end. It, there is a screw slot for it um, in the center, you know, in line with the blades with the cutter head, but mainly it's held here. And so it uses these two little nylon, you can see it's wobbling a little bit there, it uses these two little nylon screws to hold it tight against the rail. And those screws are made by like, I think maybe injection molding or something because I was trying to tighten them and loosen them here with the screwdriver and I was finding that the screwdriver wasn't exactly fitting in them very well. It seemed to be a bit difficult to get it in. So I took one of them out and had a look at it and you can see that there's a seam right across it and down the middle. And so I took a blade and I tidied up the head of that so that the screwdriver fitted in it a bit better. Here you can see I've pulled the fence off the end of the rail, but when I was doing that, I was only pulling it back to the edge of the bed. This is as far as it moves forward, which is totally fine. You can see there was like four or five centimeters of rail that weren't being used. This is it flush with the back of the rail, but when it's flush with the back of the rail, there's like, three or four centimeters of the bed that's covered. So you can't get the full width of the planer with the fence attached. So one thing you could do is slide the rail further back. But if you remember when we fitted it, those sliding um, bits of metal that hold the rail in place, the rail is flush with the front of them. So you can't move it any further back. But there is space on the other mechanism to slide it forward and backwards, this slot. There's, there's enough space to move it there. So you're in a little bit of a catch-22, and, and I think maybe this diagram shows it well. You can't move the rail, and when the fence is in the forward position, totally fine, but when the fence is in the backwards position, there's enough space in the slot, but, but the rail is not long enough. And I just don't understand it. I'm, I'm basically left thinking that this is a design flaw, that the only way to use the full width of planer bed is to totally remove the fence or to slide it off the rail and then have this jiggly 
pokery thing, trying to get it back on when you're done. I was pleased to see though that when the fence was fitted that it appears to be bang on square, um, which is ideal. I checked it along the full length and it's also pretty easy to adjust if it's not quite square. So that was already positive. Okay, now I'm going to show you how I got it off the pallet. I actually did that playing around with the fence when it was off the pallet, but I just put it all together to make it more sense in the video. So again, I got this from Jason Bentz at Bentz Woodworking. I've added a little bit of extra wood onto the edge of the pallet. And then there's these two bolts that you can feed through these holes and put nuts on them. And that allows you to use a pallet truck to lift the planar thicknesser. Now this, once I realized this, I was like, oh my goodness, that's a game changer for me. Maybe I don't need to get the extra wheels and lifting bar to move it forward and back. Now, I don't know if that's gonna be true or not, and I'll show you why in a minute. So I'm detaching the brackets that hold it on, and as you can see there, they are chunky bits of metal. I was super impressed at these, like they are not scrimping or you know missing any, any tricks here with these brackets. They're solid metal um, to hold the machine onto the pallet. The plastic is secured with 427,000 of these um, surprisingly long nails, which are a bit of a pain to get out. So I went around and I pulled all of those and some staples out just to kind of have a cleaner surface to run the pallet truck along to make sure I didn't get stuck on anything. I next built a little ramp and there it was just slightly higher than the pallet. So I took the extra bit of wood away and I figured that slightly lower than the pallet is fine because I'm just going downhill and I got the pallet truck lined up. It was too much of an angle to get underneath, so I had to kind of lift it to get it under, and, and by the time I pushed it all the way under, I kind of straightened it up manually just to make sure it was in exactly the right spot. And when I first started uh, lifting the machine, you can see it's tipping over to the side a little bit, and then I had the idea, okay, let's open up the planar beds just to balance it a bit more, and then it lifted a lot better. And this is where that extra bit of wood comes in. It just allows those front wheels to run along that piece of wood. It makes the pallet a little bit wider. I was a bit worried that it was just going to roll straight off, but you can see the machine's dragging, so I'm constantly lifting it up little bit, little bit, little bit, and then when it is all on the wrap, it slides off pretty easy, but it was easy enough to stop and, and to control it. So I was a bit nervous about doing that, but it came off fairly easy, and you can see in the pallet it's quite easy to move around, but critically you can only really move it side to side. It's not that easy to move the machine forwards to back, so I may look at getting those wheels anyway. Here I'm changing over the handle because for me another must have for this is the fine adjustment handle or whatever it is that they call it. I thought this handle was bolted on but it's not, there's actually just grooves cut in it, the same with the new one so I probably could have left the same bolt in there. Um, you just have to make sure the bolt is loose enough and then you can slide the handle on and off. The fine adjustment or um, micro adjust thing goes in the center and actually this cap was really difficult to get off. I did eventually get it but I realized that there's actually a hole in the handle so I probably could have pushed it through from behind. So this is the fine adjust dial that basically allows you to get down to like 0.1 of a mil I think it is um, when you're adjusting it and it's really cool the way it works is the outside of the dial spins but the inside stays still. And then you just slot that into the middle of this aluminium hand wheel, tighten the grub screw and it's on. Another issue for me, unfortunately, was that the in-feed bed was not coplanar with the out-feed bed. So you can see here I've got a straight edge on the out-feed bed and, you know, there's like almost a couple of mil across, you know, 50 centimeters that it's out. Before buying the machine, I'd asked the rep, is it worth paying for the setup? Because, you know, he advised getting the setup and he said, to be honest, like 90, 95% of them come out of the factory absolutely spot on. But obviously this one has um, an issue or two. So I spoke to Felder Support. They sent me a document through on how to level the bed. And you do it with those two bolts at the front by loosening the nuts and then adjusting the height of the bolt. And then at the back, those four bolts hold the bearing block in position. And there's a threaded rod at either side of at either end of the bearing block that you can adjust. You can just see the left one there. You can't quite see the right one. It's, it's kind of hidden in. You're meant to take this cover plate off to get access and see it properly. You can also micro adjust the axle or the axis that the table sits on by those four grub screws, top and bottom, and one at each side. Now, I didn't do that. I didn't touch them. I just adjusted the, the bolts that I showed you previously, the, the front and back. 
And then at some point when I was testing the table with a dial indicator, I noticed that the tighter that I did the, the locking handle, the more the table moved. And I thought that was really strange. So I had a look on the inside with a piece of paper and I noticed that the table was only making contact with one of the two bolts. So the tighter I tighten the handle, the more it pulls the table down onto the first bolt. Now this probably means that the axle or the bearing or whatever you call it that the table is mounted on probably needs to be adjusted with those eight grub screws. Because I guess it's cleaner if it just comes down to rest and makes contact on both of the bearing bolts at the front. The reason that I'm mentioning this is that somebody else's video, I think it was GT Workshop, said that over time, those because those bolts have got a rounded head, they're making quite a small patch of contact with the table, and that over time that can get worn away, or they can get like slightly depressed or squashed. And so there's this debate about how tight do you put the table, like how tight do you lock those things, and it takes quite a lot of pressure to lock it down to the point where it's firmly attached, or whether it's firmly pressing onto both bolts, and so. Yeah, I think I need to adjust the, the, the axis, which is kind of annoying because now I've got the table flat and then I'm gonna to have to adjust that and it's gonna put it out of alignment a little bit potentially. But you can see that, that mine is moving at both the front and the back of the bed and I need to put quite a lot of force to get it locked down. And then you can see here, <laughs> I'm struggling even to open it after I've done that. I have to kind of move my body position so I can get a better grip on it. And so yeah, it definitely seems like with mine, it's just not quite right. I also had a quick look at how flat the table is and I appreciate this is not a precision straight edge, this is just a woodpecker's rule, but it's fairly straight and I'm getting about a 0.2mm gap in the middle of the table, so the, the, the leading edge and the trailing edge um, or each end of the table is just slightly higher or my, my rule is slightly bent, I don't know, I would think the rule is probably straighter than the table. Um, uh, you can see there I tried to put a 0.3 and it doesn't quite fit, so yeah, about 0 0.2, 0 0.2 and a half. Okay, the last main thing to talk about is electrics. Now, I'm obviously in the UK and so this is based on, on what happens in the UK, machine supply to the UK, etc. But some of it might be relevant to other places as well. By default, Felder send you a machine with a 50 centimeter lead, which is really annoying. I, apparently I saw somebody else say that you can just request them like before you've paid just request that you want like a three meter lead on it or something and um, that would be so much handier because it means that you almost definitely have to replace the lead and um, you can see the type of cable that was on it when I got it it was a three core uh, four mil cable so each core has got a four mil cross section and I replaced that with a very similar cable this is the cable that I bought here but it wasn't super easy finding that cable. I had to kind of look through a few different cables to find exactly the one that I wanted. And the reason is that I didn't really know this because I don't know that much about cables, but even though the core sizes can be consistent, the outer diameter of the cable can vary quite a lot depending on what type of cable you buy. And so I looked at, I nearly bought, I think a four mil rubber coated flex and the rubber coated flex ones are much, much fatter. Um, and so it probably wouldn't have fitted into the machine as easily because you have to open up this little box and unscrew the cable um, from the uh, starting mechanism, whatever it's called, and feed your new cable in. And so it has to be able to fit easily in the machine. The cable that comes with the machine has got two blacks and an earth and the blacks are labeled one and two. And so uh, one is the live and two is the neutral. I think that might be standard with something that are maybe called control cables or something like that. I'm not 100% sure, I'm not an expert on this. So then once you've got your new cable in, you need to figure out what kind of plug to put in the end. I had three main options on the right. We've got a standard UK plug in the middle, a 16 amp commando plug, and on the left, a 32 amp commando plug. Now I've got three or four other machines in the workshop that are all on 16. And so if I could put this machine in a 16, it would have been handy because they could all share the same sockets and I could move the machines about later much more easily. So I emailed the rep and he sent through a screenshot that said, yep, the machine needs a 16 amp. Then I spoke to an electrician. The electrician said, yeah, the machine needs a 16 amp based on the motor plate, but the plate's not super clear because it also says A equals 19.8. But my high school uh, physics tells me that voltage times current 
equals power. And if I've got a power of 3000, divide that by my voltage, I get 13 amps. But some people on forums were saying, oh, it needs a 20 amp. I spoke to technical support, Felder Technical Support, and they said, oh, it could fit on a 16 amp or a 20 amp, but it's probably better on a 20 amp. And I still was unsure what this A figure on the motor plate means because it's showing A 19.8 amps. And I'm like, well, what is that? I emailed Felder Support and I said, is that the max current under load? And they said, yes, it's the max current under load. And I'm like, are you just repeating back to me what I've said to you or is that definitely the answer? I didn't know about this and I'm not sure I do know about this, but what I've figured out so far is that when you've got electric motors like this, there's a couple of things that you need to deal with. You need to deal with the startup load. And the startup load, when you turn the machine on and you initially get the motor going, can be very high. But you handle that with the type of breaker that you use. So if you just use a standard breaker, it's not going to work. But you get um, different types of breakers. So you use a type C breaker, which allows a high inrush of current at the beginning for a set period of time. And so it allows more than the value of the breaker for that you know, split second or however long it is at the start. Then once the machine is running, you've got the current that it takes just to run the machine and then you've got the maximum potential current under load. So the, you know, the bigger a piece of wood you put through it, the more current it's going to pull. And so I was getting a bit confused by all of that and I couldn't figure out does it need a 16 amp or does it need a 20 amp. I know it'll run on a 16 amp, but possibly if you put it under load, might trip the breaker and so I think it's better to be on a 20 amp and so I made the choice to put it on a 20 amp circuit in the UK it just jumps from 16 to 32 amp in terms of the plug so the next plug you know is rated up to 32 amp so I put a 32 amp plug on it and I ran cabling suitable for 32 amps so that in the future if I want to change the breaker I can still use that same socket for 32 amp and I don't have to change the cable that's gone all the way um, from the fuse board. Getting the cables to the machines, half of it was easy because there's these channels that run along the workshop floor so I can just lift the metal hatches and, and lay the cables in and then here it runs straight along the joist which is really handy and there's a hole just underneath the panel to bring the cables through. Uh, the electrician connected it all to the panel etc but he was happy for me to help run the cables and so I did some of the leg work there. Um, this bit was all super easy but when I got to here it was a bit trickier because I was to go from here to the machine I was having to run it against the joists and the first joist supports the ends of the floorboards there so in that gap there there's a solid wood joist that's like 50 mil or more thick and so I looked at different ideas I thought maybe I could lift the floorboards or something like that but in the end I drilled through the joist and drilled through the floor at the end and spent a little while it was a bit tricky but I managed to fish a piece of string with a magnet on the end through both of the holes um, and once I'd fished the, the piece of string, then I could attach it to a thicker piece of string. And then with a thicker piece of string, I could put both the cables through. And because one of the cables I was using was a six mil twin and earth, it was quite tough to get around um, the tight corner coming up at the other end, but I did manage to do it. And once I got it there, I stuck a bit of OSB on the wall and, and ran some conduit to keep the cables protected all the way to the sockets. Hope you found this video interesting. And some of the electrical stuff I'm not 100% sure so please take what I've said with a pinch of salt and if you know better then leave a comment and if you've enjoyed the video I'd be really grateful for a like and subscribe.